Hello, I'm Dr. Pendergrass, and I was looking through YouTube, thinking of the stuff that's out there in the world, and there's a lot of nonsense. I came across this video. It says, a progressive Christian look at John 3.16. So you can just on YouTube. This apparently is the pastor, preacher, minister, someone who's preaching at this church, Douglas UCC. And here's what he says. I, I watched just a, just a minute or two of it, and I thought, okay, I've got to do a video on this. I don't got to, but there we go. Here we go. So the very beginning... This guy is talking about John 3.16 and Tim Tebow and sports and so forth. But then he says how John 3.16 is a favorite verse of evangelicals. So let's hear what he says about how to properly read John 3.16. So what is it about John 3.16 that evangelical Christians love so much? What do we love Why about is it? it favorite, favorite Bible verse that they want to tell everybody about? Yes. What is well, it? I'd like to think it's the first six words Why? that say, for God so loved the world. Uh, that's exactly right. That is exactly a huge distinction between modern progressive Christianity and biblical Christianity. Yes, I said it. Because Jesus did not go around and simply say, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. God the Father loves you, loves you, loves you, loves you. That's not what he, all he said. Read the Gospels. You can disagree with Jesus and think he's an absolute lunatic, but at least get it right. So I know you want people to focus on God so loved because then you get to define what love means. Two, you could ignore everything else Jesus said, which is the whole, he talked a lot about uh, repentance and judgment and hell. He also talked about love. Of course he did. All I'm saying is it's both and, not either or. It's not just about hell. It's not just about love, but here we go. Wouldn't that be awesome? No. If that was the message they wanted everybody to hear and everybody to know, that God loves you so much. That? But sadly, no, I believe it's the latter part of the verse that they want to emphasize and make clear that Jesus is the... And see, this is very common with people. They talk about what others, what evangelicals. So Christians talk about other Christians all the time. Progressives, evangelical, evangelical, Christians, against the Catholics, against the Pentecostals. Frankly, I think most of that's pretty disgusting and stupid and horrible and a waste of time. Christians should stop wasting so much energy on talking about each other. They should talk about Jesus. So while he might not, he might not like evangelicals, and probably because he's homosexual or so forth, okay, let's assume the entire world is not full of one single evangelical. Now what do we do with Jesus? What difference does it make? The only way that leads to salvation. The misunderstanding over John 3.16 has led many Christians in America today to believe that one must accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior or they will be condemned to hell. Now I'm real interested here. By the way, that's not what evangelicals, evangelicals don't go to John 3.16 to decide that Jesus is the only way. They get from other verses than John, not from John 3.16 particularly. But So yeah, they inappropriately think other people go to hell. So I'm curious, how else does he interpret John 3.16? Let's... That is not what John 3.16 means. Okay, what does it mean? That is not what Jesus is saying nope. in today's gospel. He's not, let's see what he says. So what does it mean? Yeah. What is he saying? Well, let's look at it together. Let's do it. If you noticed in the gospel, Jesus is referring to terms. Son of God. Mm. Son of man. Mm. Only begotten son. No. What? And he says things like all who believe in him will have. Okay. At no point has Jesus said that in John's gospel so far. Have eternal life. Why wouldn't he say all who believe in me because will Jesus... have eternal life? Go read John 3.16. John, John 3.16. Jesus isn't talking. The author of John's gospel is saying this. Dude, I can't. This is so typical. Why is Jesus talking in the third person? He's not. You know, people who refer to themselves in the third person are often narcissists. <laughs> Jesus is not being narcissistic here. I agree, because he didn't say it. Even if he did. Uh -huh. The reason it. Jesus is not being narcissistic here is because he's not referring to himself. I agree. He's not referring to himself. Because he's, he's not talking. Son of God uh -oh. and only begotten son uh -oh. are terms for the Christ. Okay. And I've told you before. What'd you tell me? The Christ existed billions of years before Jesus of Nazareth was even born. I can't when wait. When God birthed. <laughs> everything into existence and said, let there be light. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There was the Christ. The divine DNA was infused 
into all of creation. God so loved the world that God gave us of its very nature, its own DNA. Now God's an it. <laughs> I mean, you either cry or you laugh. What kind of stupid nonsense is this? His divine DNA? You think God has DNA in his... Di what are you smoking? In Genesis, billions of years ago, the Messiah came through particles in the universe? What are you talking about? <laughs> And this whole crowd of people, mm, that's good. Jesus was a man from Nazareth who lived more than 2,000 years ago. Yeah. And during his lifetime, he had an awakening, a discovery, mm. a realization mm. that he and God were not two, but one. And because of that, Jesus was able to fully manifest the Christ. Mm. And he made it his mission after that realization Mm. to go out into the world mm. and to teach others that they too could experience this oneness with God. What in the world are you talking about? Where does any of, where one Bible verse that Jesus around tell people they can experience this, this, this oneness with God, one big gooey oneness. What Jesus now apparently is a Buddhist. You just gotta be one with the universe and there's is this a divine spark nonsense inside all of us and so you think jesus is the buddha that's what it is the buddha means the awakened one so you think he was siddhartha gautama so sid i like to call him sid we're old friends you think he's just like sid but where sid is called the enlightened one the buddha they prefer to use a different word called messiah but they mean the same thing they both become enlightened and they both tell people that the divine's in you and you can be one with everything i can't I, I guess I'm about to sound like the disciples. I don't know why his gay scarf didn't burst into flames right now. And he said, follow the way. Me? What was the way? Well, yeah. What the was... way of forgiveness. Okay. The way of service. Mm -hmm. The way of unconditional love. Because mm -hmm. Jesus knew that when you lived from that way. Okay, he just skipped over the number one message of Jesus. Go read it, Mark 1, 14 to 15. The number one chief topic of the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. Every historical Jesus scholar knows this. This is not novel what I'm about to say. Jesus preached the impending, the arrival of God's reign, the kingdom of God. Jesus believed he ushered it in. He was that long-awaited king, and he brought with him the king, the kingly reign. And the only appropriate, logical, moral thing to do in response to the reign of God right in their midst is to repent of their sin and then follow Jesus. Deny their will, pick up the cross to follow him. This is so typical. You just skip over everything that talks about repentance and sin and just jump right over to cozy, warm, fuzzy things like service and love. You stopped listening to the voice of the ego, the voice of the small self, the voice of separation and darkness. And you start to awaken more and more to the light, mm. to your true self, mm. to your divine self. Oh, right there. Oh, this stuff is some scary nonsense. This has got 55,000 views four years ago. I mean, this is some, this is like the secret. I think the thing that Oprah liked it a whole lot. There's divine inside of you and all that stuff. I mean, this is, this is some dangerous, devilish nonsense. Who are you in the biblical worldview? You are a child of the most high God who has absolutely rebelled against him. You are a sinner and you deserve, and I deserve the consequences of sin. When you commit crimes in the kingdom, you deserve to be punished by the king. And that's exactly what we deserve to have. And the only way to deal with that is live a perfectly crimeless life forever. Try that. I bet you've already failed once, which means you deserve to be punished. And the only response to that is Jesus saying, I love you so much, I'll die on the cross for you. But you have to admit you're a sinner, not, not, you need to admit that you're divine. You need to admit that you need to come to the light. You need to admit that you need to deny your ego. <laughs> I can't. To your Christ self. What? <laughs> so Jesus didn't say that he was the only one. In fact, if you read the Gospels, he says just the opposite. What does he say? He stood in front of crowds of people and uh -huh. said, You oh. are sons and daughters of God. Mm. And he said, You are the light of the world. Mm -hmm, that's and true. And he said, 
all of the things that I have done, y'all. you can do. And quoting from Psalm 82. Oh, yeah, okay, I won't go there. In John's gospel, right, and y'all will do to his apostles, y'all will do plural, you all will do greater things, greater, even more things than I have done via the Holy Spirit. His apostles, his original disciples, who had repented of their sins and followed Jesus on the way. He did not walk up to strangers and say, you're all divine, you all can do what I can do. You're all God. Jesus said, you are all sons of the most high mm. you are all gods mm. that's what jesus said oh this is eerie i think he's about to say if you'll just bow down i will give you the kingdoms he won't know this i'm quoting the new testament i'm quoting the temptations of satan to jesus just turn this stone to bread i just feel like he's about to burst into this do you believe him no I don't. Because Jesus says in today's gospel, all who believed, no, all who believe this, that's not what he will said. have eternal life. Golly, that's not what he said. Jesus didn't say it. And John didn't say, believe that crap you just said, you'll have eternal life. That is not at all. If you believe that. I don't. Really believe that. I don't really. That you're a child of God. You are the light. That's true. You that's are true. gods. Yeah. No. You experience salvation. Oh, well, good. Well, then I won't get it. I won't be saved. I won't be saved. I won't because I will agree with Jesus, not this gibberish. Salvation no. is not about the next life. It's not? It's not about when you die, you're saved in the mm. next life. Okay, what is it about? Salvation means freedom. Mm. What word in Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, in the Latinism, I'll give you Latin, it's not even Latin. Salvation means freedom. When you awaken to this truth about yourself, mm -hmm. You live a life of freedom. Oh, okay. Jesus oh. said, you shall know the truth, mm. and the truth shall set you free. Yeah, I wish he could speak the truth. I wish we know what when the truth is. When you know this truth of your being, mm. you're freed. This is exactly what a lot of, I mean, that's what the Buddha said, really. And it's also what, what's Scientology, dude? Oh, I'm uh, him. Yeah. Uh, I can't even say Joseph Campbell. No, it's not. Uh, anyway, it's Dianetics. That's who you are. you got to wake up to who you are. So... Let's take John 3, 16 and translate it. Please. What does it mean? Yes. For God so loved the world uh -huh, uh -huh. Talk that to God gave us of its very nature. It, of its very nature. It's only begotten. It's divine DNA. Oh. So that all who believe in it and live from that mm. will live a life of freedom. Mm. So John 3, 16 means not at all what it means because you're not quoting John 3.16. That, oh, well then, maybe he's never read John 3.16. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe he's got a Bible that's or- That's what it means. A translation of that. That's what Jesus was trying to convey. Oh. The 13th century Christian mystic, who was known as Meister Eckhart, said this. Uh-oh, Eckhart. God never begot only one son. Mm. The eternal is forever begetting the mm. only begotten. God never begot but one son. The eternal is forever begetting the only begotten. He wrote that in the 13th century. <laughs> I'm not giving you new age mumbo jumbo here, folks. Yes, you are. The reason... <laughs> I'd say he needs to go to school, but he won't go to school because he'll... He will Early church, I don't know the I card to read it, but it is true that for centuries that patristic authors said things like he was always begetting, begetting the son. That's because as Trinitarian theology, they were trying to make it very, very clear that Jesus wasn't a creature. Jesus was not created. And so he's the only begotten son. They would say uh, he's the causally prior. There's God. It's a logical thing. Father, son, and spirit. That is, he is, God the father is eternally begetting the son. Right. To make it point that it's from all eternity, he's begetting the son. There was never a time that Jesus, that the son was not, that the son was not. I mean, a basic historical theology class at a decent school would have taught him not to say such dumb things like this. This is ancient wisdom. No, it's not. This is the truth of the ages. I can't believe. The truth that will set you free. <laughs> Buddha knew this truth. There he is. I knew Yogananda. it. Yogananda knew this truth. I knew it. Muhammad 
knew this truth. Oh, yeah, Muhammad said the same thing. Gandhi so. knew this truth. <laughs> Muhammad said the same stuff. That was Muhammad said. When Muhammad, when Muhammad, Muhammad went around with his, his sword and he was slaughtering the caravans, that's the whole point. That's the whole point he was telling everybody. You need to know who you are. You are divine DNA, al Akbar. And if they don't recognize that you too can be Buddha, that you too are Messiah, I'm going to chop your head off. That was the message. Just read the Quran. It's everywhere. Everywhere. So it is not about becoming a Christian. And it is not about accepting Jesus Mm. as your personal Lord and Savior. Okay. All right. It is about knowing Mm. that the eternal is begotten in you. Mm. That it lives in you Mm. and as you. Man, that is some dangerous, evil, twisted, reverse crap. I can't, I mean, that is some evil, twisted, disgusting, horrible. Boy, them evangelical Christians really get upset. I'm not all up. I'm saying it because that's some evil, twisted, because the reality is there's God and then you. And you are not equals. And you are not God. And I am not God. And I didn't give my life to myself. I didn't deny my will to myself and follow myself. No, I mean, this is some twisted, gibberish junk. When you know that truth, Mm. you're set free. Yeah, set me free, brother. And that's why the symbol of our faith is the cross. Because it symbolizes where the human Mm -hmm. and the eternal meet. That's why. That is exactly what the cross (laughs) is. The cross is nothing but a symbol. It has, that's it. It has nothing to do Nothing to do with all the gospel saying Jesus was crucified in Golgotha in the place of the skull. It's not because it was a torture device. It was it was it was made up uh, by billions of years ago. People made this symbol and become one. Now, in our two readings today, the Old Testament and the New Testament, we hear about another symbol, the symbol of the snake. Uh-oh. Being lifted up. Okay, yeah. Uh-huh. What does it mean? Yeah, who know. I don't. Well, what I'm, is a snake? If you ask. think about it, a snake crawls on the ground. Oh, it can only no. see things from an earthly perspective. Oh no. A low understanding. Okay, that's just called allegory. Anyway, so he's talking. <laughs> He's probably talking about the lectionary, and the reason why they read that from it's the book of Numbers is because in John chapter 3, right before then, it, Jesus actually does speak in John's gospel. And I'll read it here in John three thirteen. It says, No one has ascended into heaven except the one who's descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses uh, lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And that's true. Jesus didn't call himself the Son of God. He said that earlier that he said that. Son of Man. So that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. So, G- that, G- verse 14, one more time. Just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so the Son of Man is lifted up. There, he's, just, he's just an allusion to Numbers chapter 9, and it's a I won't go there right now, but the point is, uh, and Jesus is saying, just like that will be raised up as a sign to people. And in John's gospel, him being lifted up as not about being praised. We hear that in churches. We got to lift him up. Uh, has nothing about lifting up metaphorically and praise him, exalting him. It means on a cross. So, and, and the resurrection and ascension. So here what he says. So this is a snake. Let's see. Moses uh-huh. tells the people and Jesus tells the apostles, take the snake and lift it up. He's on the not the, the son apostles. of man must be lifted up. Uh huh. Stop seeing things from a low perspective, oh, an earthly perspective. That's the whole. And point. raise your consciousness. Mm. See things from a higher perspective. Mm. There's, there's nothing more first century Jew than <laughs> raising your higher consciousness. I mean, if I were to time travel today and ask anybody on the street. I mean, any normal first century Jew would have said, any educated, you need to raise your consciousness. It's not thinking so. (laughs) I'm sorry. That's just Christian irony. That's what the season of Lent is about. It's a time for us to go out into the wilderness. Oh, my head hurts. Where is that? I don't know. A place of quiet. Okay. It's the secret dwelling place Mm. of the Most High. Yeah. And where is it? Inside you. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. Oh, here it is. I knew it was coming. Lent, that's a favorite thing. Yeah, the kingdom of God is in Yeah, that's favorite. That's a favorite. Lent is a time for us to go within and there start seeing things from a higher consciousness. Oh, my goodness. And start giving up and removing mm. all of the things that, that are what? keeping you from that light. What is the light? And for some Christians, 
the things that they need to give up are very limiting beliefs, mm. religious beliefs mm -hmm. that problem. they unknowingly and unquestioningly just took on from childhood. That's it. All of us, man, that's just so sad. It's so sad. I have heard, I've learned so much from progressive Christians lately who tell me that I'm, I've just been duped. I'm just a little stupid moron who's, it's just sad for people like me. The only reason we believe these things from Jesus is because we've all been brainwashed. And I, that makes me sad for me and people like me that we can't think and we can't read, we can't reason. And without people with massive apostrophes on their scarves, we wouldn't know how to make it. Uh, we wouldn't know how to live life. I, I'm just so... I don't, man, it's just sad for people like me that, I mean, my degrees were worthless. I just, it's all from childhood. I learned everything I learned about in John 3, 6 from childhood, apparently from this guy. Jesus is the only one. Oh, okay. Never questioned it. And sometimes in order to. The arrogance of that, the, the daggum arrogance to tell people you're a bunch of brainwashed, stupid idiots who have never questioned it. That's why you believe something dumb. It's so arrogant. I don't think he's brainwashed and dumb and never thought of question his beliefs, even though I fundamentally disagree. He's just a silly gibberish. But I wouldn't say you clearly believe this because you're gay parents or what. I mean, give me a break. To grow spiritually, we have to get rid of those limited religious mm -hmm. beliefs. Yeah, we do. The limiting. Now, the 20th century Christian mystic, uh -oh. Thomas Merton, uh -oh. yep. said, He's a biggie. If the you of five years ago, doesn't consider the you of today mm -hmm. to be a heretic, you are not growing spiritually. That's just the stoop. I mean, it's so... Merton is respected, but he was a mystic. He wasn't a biblical scholar at all, and he just wasn't. And who, well, that's what Merton said. Merton, what he, if, if he said that, if he said that, he's wrong. He's wrong. It is, it is possible to hold on to a belief for more than a few seconds or for a few years and it still be true all things past the last second aren't deemed false just because time progresses that is so dumb that people say this kind of nonsense we must give up those things that are keeping us from growing spiritually i so hope in five years it's been four years since he posted this video or whoever did i hope in one more year he wakes up and goes everything i said in this stupid video was heretical i hope so i do hope for his sake for recognizing our light yeah so i hope that for the remainder of the season of Lent, you will find dimmed. time each day to go out into the wilderness nope to become still, mm -hmm. to hear that still small voice within. That tells you what? And to awaken more and more mm -hmm. to the truth Is of what? your being. When you know this truth, mm. you will be set free. All the people say amen. Namaste. Yeah. He even said almost day. He even said almost day. See, this is a bunch of Buddhist in Michigan. Oh, I'm sorry, people in Douglas. I'm so sorry. I can't. Okay, I'm so sorry. Well, that's all for now. I'm going to go ponder my gooey oneness with the universe, and I'll see you next time.